are longer serving as the art director of the IBWC. Is this correct? Yeah, I had to step down. We actually got somebody that had a lot of experience to step in um, that I could learn from, so I stepped down as the art director. Oh, good, good. Um, after the research and interviews that I had done for my capstone project at BSU, the Veterans Mental Health and Suicide Awareness Project 2019, what can we do for the 22? I learned that the state of Idaho is the eighth highest state in suicide ranking right now, and that 16 to 22 veterans are taking their lives on a daily basis. This equates to roughly 480 to 660 per month, 5,760 to 7,920 7 veterans per year. Although these veterans' deaths are national figures and not specific to the state of Idaho, I realized after doing the research on this project and talking to the different veterans and veterans representatives that I did, that there are five areas of focus, I call them five pillars, that need to be addressed for all our current returning veterans. One is education, another one is employment, the third one is housing, the fourth one is mental health, and the fifth one is reintegration into society. I would, like to sh I would first like you to share your thoughts on what the difference is between the veterans from World War I, World War II, and the post-Vietnam veterans, including those who are serving today. What do you believe are the contributing factors to the rise in veteran suicides? The, one of the big problems that we have on the, the numbers is that we're, they, you have to do a lot of research to find out the age. Um, a lot of older veterans are committing suicide. And part of that is, you just had something come up. Oh, never mind. Uh, that, uh, when you, when you, World War One, World War Two, uh, even Korea, when they came back, they went to work, um, and now they're getting older and they're no longer working, and they're having a hard time getting into the VA system because they didn't do it. Uh, Vietnam, we're having the same thing, and we're starting to see the same thing starting to happen with the current veterans. Uh, reintegration is, it, you know, back into society is one thing but it's extremely hard to reintegrate with your family. Also, uh, World War One, World War II, Korea, and those, it took time for the veterans to get from where they did combat to come home. Um, they had time to dewind, you know, dewind. Uh, they had time to talk with their brothers about what they saw, how they felt, and not be judged. Uh, starting with Vietnam, uh, it was literally one day you were in combat, three days later you were home. Uh, and with, uh, with the technology that we have today, the speed of the aircraft that we have today, the very same thing is happening. Uh, I use myself as an example. I'm sitting in Iraq, the next day I'm sitting in Kuwait. Three days later, I'm sitting at Fort Lewis, Washington, and three days later, I'm sitting at home. And my family wants me to start being Bob again. And I'm still trying to figure out, you know, my schedule's thrown off. Um, we haven't had a chance, I haven't had a chance to dewind. And so for me, it was really, really hard. And I know a number of people that, that it was that way. Uh, they were still in Iraq. There was none of this gradual uh, going from combat to, to peace. Um, you, you're still going to have problems, but there's it's more stretched out, and the family can deal with you coming home. And uh, with the modern stuff that we have today, you know, they can start asking you, what do you want to do when you get home? Uh, you know, Vietnam, you know, we definitely didn't have that. Half the time, you know, any letters that I sent got home, you know, two months after I got home. And so they were real relevant. But, you know, we can FaceTime, we can text, we can, you know, Facebook and everything else. So the families can, can start finding out what 
that person coming back would like to do. Uh, and tell, tell the, that person coming back what they would like to do. You know, um, you know, I got home and the first thing out of my kids' mouth was, Dad, what are you gonna cook tonight? And I didn't even know what was in the house. I'd been gone for a year. I'm like going, uh, you know, uh, I needed it, I needed to do it, but I was so afraid of messing up because I hadn't cooked. Uh, and I had injuries that I had to work around, you know. So the big big one is is the time between when you were in combat and when you got home is, I feel, the big major difference. For our older vets, we're working and then suddenly we're not. And now we have time to think about the past. Um, and when you say older veterans, are you, what would you consider older veterans? Are you talking about baby boomer veterans? Uh, people that served in Vietnam, uh, Korea, are, are our older veterans. Uh, the thing is, is that we have a huge number of older veterans, uh, you know, uh, that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and they have well-paying jobs. They feel useful, they're wanted, they're needed, they're injured, they come home and suddenly all of that and they have to reinvent themselves at 45, 50. Uh, and there's so many obstacles in that way. And education, you need four years of college is what people tell you. Well, by the time you get done with that education, you're trying to compete with a 22 year old and you're 50 or 55 or 58 and you've gone through your savings, you've gone through all of this. All of those are added additional things that cause you to feel like a failure because now I can't get a job because I'm competing with this kid that can work for the company for 20 years, whereas maybe 10 years, you know, if I, you know, if I want to retire at 65, you know, and actually, you know, spend time with my family. So it, there, there's no set answer. That's the problem. Um, all I can say is what works for me and what works for my family. Uh, my wife is a disabled vet, so the things that we've learned that work with her, uh, we've adjusted those uh, because my circumstances were different from hers. Uh, Somalia and Haiti were nothing like Iraq. I went to Iraq going to war. My wife went to Somalia to feed starving kids and still got shot at and blown up, and, but it wasn't a war. Uh, when they went into Haiti, they moved to Haiti thinking they were going to have to invade this town, this island, and in one day it changed to, nope, we're just going to help keep the peace. Okay. so. Um Getting, I want to get back to something that you stated early in the conversation. You said a lot of veterans, um, they either don't know how to how to get into the system, they're not aware of getting into the system, or they just choose not to get into the system. So, what do you mean by getting into the system? Well, the VA has a tremendous amount of things that they do for veterans. Uh, the sooner you get into the system uh, and get your medical history uh, recorded, as you get older, that's already there. Instead of what's happening with a number of people, uh, they didn't. They came back from Vietnam and they didn't. They had nothing. Wanted nothing to do with the VA. Well, now they're there in their 60s, and they're trying to track down the medical records. They're trying to track down, they're trying to, t because the VA has things in place that even if I can't find the medical records, if I can find somebody that says, yes, this person, I was there, but because of the age, those people are dying off. And because of Agent Orange and half a dozen other things, these people are dying off. Um, so getting the help that you need and you deserve and is owed you, uh, you can't do because the things that are set up for you to do that, 
rely on other people and those people are dying off. Um, not wanting to get into the system, uh, you know, for, I, I listened from a very early age, the horrors of the VA system, and we hear it today. Uh, you know, doctors not caring and uh, all these other things. Um, that make you not want to deal with the VA. The problem is, is that you are, we hear about the one doctor or the one nurse or the one whatever, social worker, psychologist, whatever, that screwed over a whole bunch of vets. But you don't hear about the other 5,000 that have done just unbelievable things for veterans. We focus on that one bad person instead of all the good people. It's nice to know that that person, you know, about that person, but we need to also talk about all the good the VA is doing. Okay. Uh, because that causes too many people to go like, I'm just gonna suffer in silence. I'm gonna drink my alcohol, do my drugs, get in trouble with the law, and you know, and that doesn't mean that every veteran does that. I know a number of veterans that have never been to the VA that are doing great, but they also managed to luck out and get into jobs that had really good health care. So they use civilian health care to do their, take care of their issues.